Hey everybody, Mark here from Tiling Connect. Welcome to today's episode. I have the uh, honour and privilege of speaking with Frank Mobus, um, who has been in the industry for a long, long time. There's no other way of putting it. It would be definitely um, two decades and um, has contributed immensely um, to uh, to the tiling and waterproofing space. And uh, as we uh, as we have it in every episode, we we don't I don't like to chew up the um, the airtime with my voice too much. So I'm gonna um, welcome Frank to the show. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for having me on. Hey, mate, you're very welcome. Oh, uh, yeah, Frank, I'd love to really wind it back to the beginning. Uh, you and I have known each other for at least 15 years that I know of. There could be a couple of other years in there somewhere. Um, mate, tell us about your time in the industry and how it all started and give us a, a background. Uh, give us a, give us a good look, look at your background. Well, it was just a little bit longer than a couple of decades ago. It goes actually closer to five, to be honest. Wow. Um, so I was born in Germany into a, uh, family of, of, of a tiling company. My old man's a tiler, has been for a long time, and his brother was a tiler. And things are a little bit different in Germany. You, you, uh, you know, it's a lot of supply and fixed time. Uh, so I grew up with uh, uh, sheds in the backyard full of tiles. So we used to play hide and seeking. So that's mm-hmm. my very first introduction. But when it became... You know, when I got to like 10, 11, 12, guess what I had to do in school holidays? Tile. Off to the building sites. Come along, Tiger. Let's uh, do a bit of tiling. So obviously, like, like every young fella, first job's on a broom and a shovel. But, you know, you do learn how to uh, do some tiling. You know, you know what hand fixing of tiles is, you know, um, standing some men mud on the back of the tile and you tap the tile into the wall. That's basically how it was done back in those days in the in the mid seventies. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that's um mm. that's a that's a pretty um that's a pretty remarkable start, right? Not too many people can say that they've done that, I, I imagine. No, in you know, yeah, you know, not, not not too many people in my age um that can let learned in the, the basics of the trade in Europe. You know, it's a little bit different. They build more solidly over there because it tends to get a bit cold in winter time with frozen ground. Mm. Um, so the building's a little bit different over there. Yeah, right. But yeah, it came here when I was sixteen. Yeah. And uh went to high school, went to university, spent some time in the military and then, you know, tried to tried my hardest to get out of the tiling industry to be honest, but Kind of sucked you back in this game. I think you was there was at least a few times, wasn't there, that you tried to exit stage left. Oh, I've done it. You know, the good thing you know about it, when you do a learn a trade is you can try so many different things, anything you like, but you've always got your trade to fall back on. Mm. You know, if you uh, and that that's you know, I encourage young people out there learn a trade. Because once you got the trade behind you, then the world's your oyster. You can try whatever you like. Mm-hmm. So when you um, when you moved over here, you were sixteen. Have you always been in Queensland? Is that is that been sort of? Or no, you we, no. We actually originally uh, came to Melbourne, and we lived in Sorrento. You know where Sorrento is down the Mornington Peninsula. Mornington Peninsula, yeah. Yeah, and. Um, you know, I, I sort of, we came in May, which is kind of in the middle of the school year. So I spent the first year um, on building sites. Yep. Uh, like we did uh, the refurb of Flinders Street Station. We did the new construction of Box Hill staging, um, Stations. Now I'm really aging myself. <laughs> <laughs> Those buildings, you know, it was in the commercial space. Yep. Um, and then at the end of that year, I uh, went back to high school and finished my what was then called HSC. I don't know what it's called nowadays. Some weird name, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and um, then after that, I went to uni. What did you study at uni, mate? I know I, I know that there's a number of things on your CV, but if I had to remember them off the top of my that, head, I would get that's all not, of them wrong. That's not... That's not listed on my CV at all, mate. Oh, isn't it? No? Okay. No, I'll no, the qualifications I, that I saw. 
Yeah. Uh, I actually um, got into medicine, so I, you could have called me Dr. Frank right now if you if I'd stuck with it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it wasn't for me, mate. You know, I had enough of study, so I, uh, I got out of that. Yeah. And some, uh, you know, actually joined the Army Reserve. I spent nine years in there, and that's really where I got my introduction to the training side of life. You know, I was at a uh, a, a, a unit that trained young officer cadets that end, end up becoming officers and what they call leaders of men. So I did a lot of training over those nine years of, of young people, which is good. Mm. Really, really enjoyed training. What are you? Um, what is it about the training that you enjoy most? Is it, yeah? Oh well, you, you acquire some knowledge over your life, and it's you need to. Oh, I think everyone who has that knowledge has an obligation to pass it on. Mm. You know, and and it's no good you know, taking it to the grave with you. Just leave the base, the place a better place. And when you found it, it's, that's my philosophy. And if part of that is training young people. Or, or even older people, you know, I still run training sessions now for um, tradies that have been in the industry for years. Mm. Um, alone. Well, I, I think it's important. You know, if, as soon as you stop learning, that's it. You need to need to learn and move forward and improve. I imagine, that, get better. I, I imagine there's a massive emphasis on training in the ADF, um, like. A lot of organisations, um, but more so in in those sort of departments. Well, unless there's some sort of military action somewhere, it is literally all training. There's all training. Nothing, yeah. nothing else you do. <laughs> and you know, I, I was I was a, a, a defence member at a time where it was relatively stable in the world. There's yep. nothing going on. Um, but when I got out, you know, we've we've obviously had some time in Afghanistan. We've had uh, East Timor before that. Yeah, been a few things going on, but that was after I discharged. Mm. Yeah, so so you acquired you would have acquired a whole bunch of skills there. And when was it post the ADF that tiling came calling again? Oh no, I was so I was in the in the army reserve, so I was ah. had a full time job, and yep. uh, um, the um, the my military service was was on a, as a reservist, so. I still had, you know, I was still working full time, plus doing military service. Um, so it's not like tolling came calling after it or during it. Just it just continued. It was always there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And yes. um, further on in your career, um, how did Tyler? What did, what did tiling look like for you as as um, as you as the years went by? What, how do you mean? Um, uh, were you tiling locally in in Queensland? I mean, did you have a particular flavour, or did you have um, any any uh, specific types of tiling that you were doing? Uh, look, I, I spent a lot of my early tiling career in the in the in the nineties. You know, we moved to Queensland in ninety three. You know, basically there was not much work going on in Melbourne. Queensland had a reasonably active construction industry, so yeah, we moved up here. Um, Started off really in house building. Um, in, in yeah, it's basically domestic houses, mum and dad sort of houses. Um, I sort of started my own business in, I guess, 98 or something like that. Got my yeah. QBCC license, did my own thing. Um, that's quite interesting when I, when I, so when I left, departed from my own, from the old man, I, really you know had a blank slate nothing yeah it was we had a bit of a disagreement and i you know i said i see you later i'll do my own thing so i basically you know the strathpine brendale area there was yeah. about 15 yeah. tire shops in in, in close you know, in close vicinity so i yeah. went into every single car shop and i said start my own business i'm happy to um uh, can I leave some business card here? Happy to do um, any kind of work. I'm not a, not too bad at sales, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'd like to come on here on, on Saturdays to uh, yeah 
help some of your customers uh, with selections of what you can and can't tile, et cetera, et cetera. I went to every single tile shop and finally one of them said, okay, no worries, let's come in on, you know, happy free to come in on Saturday. So I did that and actually won quite a bit of work. Yeah, awesome. Doing that and, and it actually benefited the tile shop as well. That's a pretty innovative approach, right? I mean, I think that may, this may be the second time I've heard that because I know that you and I have known each other for a while and I'm pretty certain that we've touched on that just in conversations in the past. And I still, now that you say it again, I, I recall us speaking about that over a decade ago. And it, I mm. even then thought it was just such an innovative way to grow your brand and grow your skill and acquire more business. It's just um, for, for a very, very little investment, you know, it's just, just a bit yeah, of time, right? Just a bit of time. Yeah. But one, you know, uh, did, you know, th that happened to be the tile factory outlet in Lawton, right? Which, as you probably know, is the shop I, I I bought later on, right? Yeah. And and David Peel, who's you know, mountains and mountains of industry experience of, of tile supply and, and wholesale and import, he always said this: if you walk into a carpet shop, you don't walk out with a roll of carpet on your shoulder and a bunch of carpet layers business cards in your hand, right? So if you can do the supply and install deal at the time, then yeah, you know, you've basically made that deal. And, and if you do a, a right job, you get referrals, which is the other part of that. So it worked in my favour. On my business got started, and look, I don't mind doing a kitchen splashback. Yeah, you know, you got to if someone wants a kitchen splashback done, I'll do your kitchen splashback, no problem. Mm. But at the same time, yeah, you, know, you might want a hundred meters of patio tiling done yeah well i'll do that too nice but you know you can talk to people while they're there selecting the tiles and you can say okay well this tile in this situation it's probably not ideal because of this this and this and this and when you've got a tiling license for some reason they listen to you more than when you're the salesperson in the shop so mm. it, was, it worked really well for both of us yeah my perfect i i you know, my day, earlier days, I started off working in retail showrooms, selling tiles. You would remember um, Ceramic Tile Market down at Springwood there. Mm -hmm. um, CTM at the time when I was working for them had, I think, 11 shops around Australia, um, partially South African owned. Uh, and um, it, I, I can feel your, um, I can, I, get, I can verbally and physically feel what you're saying because a lot of customers would already come in after speaking with a tiler about, you know, what they should select for their bathrooms or main mm. floor areas. So there was that preconceived idea before they even stepped foot in the store, they'd consulted with a professional and that person had um, given, them the, given them the advice based upon their house or the project that they were doing. And that conversation, and you could just feel that they were um, quite influenced by the contractor. In, mm. in you know what to choose so um and it, you could noticeably see the difference between someone that are already engaged with a contractor versus someone that hadn't engaged yeah so yeah yeah the funny thing it was always what do you think of this color and i'm going i'm keeping out of color mate <laughs> i'm i'm not a color person yes this is a floor tile it can go on your floor no problem <laughs> this is a wall tile let's restrict that to walls only shall we yeah that that was you know the, the sort of thing, but you know people would say, oh, you know what what patterns can you do? You know, I did a, for some reason back in that day it was half tile border diagonal tiles. That was a trend. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well. Gets a little bit boring after a while. Mate, later on in your career, you've um you've done quite a bit of work um with some some big companies and um. I know that throughout your entire career, well, I know um, personally more recently, you've done a lot of consultancy work, um, mm -hmm. particularly when you're with Basit. Um, you're working there in a training capacity and you um, obviously your consultancy has always been a big part of what you do. And that that's obviously, obviously you've, you've acquired so much knowledge over time to be able to do that. Um, how did, um, how was your time with Basit? I mean, they, they're, they're a great company. Um, how did, how was it, how was that period? Oh, it, it was it was great. You know, it, it was um, yeah, my consultancy work actually started before I started with Basic. 
Um, and right. you know, I, I I'd spent some time at Mapay where I met the Mal Ferrara, who's the CEO of of um, Bayset now. Yeah. And uh, you know, one day we were talking, and he said, "Well, you should come on board with us. I need a, a quality manager, and I need a training manager." So I ended up being, you know, after they base it nationalised, I become the national quality in training manager. <laughs> uh, well, it's obviously quite important. Yeah. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm established a training um, system there for staff and for contractors. So that now there's a the the, the base at training and education centre is 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 at head office at Purpose Plains. Mm. They've just moved, so they've got to rebuild that. So that'll be a bit of expense, bit of an expense for them. Um, but every state has a, a training facility in it for contractors and staff, so that worked really well. Um, and it's important, you know. Obviously, staff need to be knowledgeable, but there's so many changes happening in the industry all the time that you need to make sure the contractors are kept up to date if they wish to show up. Mm. That's half time. Half the time, that's the problem. You know, you send the invitations out. Thirty people say that yes, I'll come, and then you get fifteen turning up. But that's quite normal. Mm. Yeah. And you know, the quality management. Um, I'm pretty proud of of having set up the the code mark system for uh, for all the base set membranes. So they are pretty well the most highly tested. And, uh, and certified membrane systems on the Australian market right now. Wow. Mm. That took, that was probably three and a half years of work. I was going to hazard yeah, a guess at of, a few, a few yeah. years worth of work. Yeah. Yeah. But it's all worth it. So mm. at the end of the day, it's it's all about making sure that the person who purchases the product gets exactly what's what they think they're getting. Mm. And there's nothing worse than opening a bucket in what it says on the label isn't exactly what you're getting. Mm. So you've got to make sure that what's in the bucket is what you get. And that should be the case across the industry. And I'm not saying that membranes who aren't Codemark certified aren't good or or uh, or what's in those buckets isn't what it says in the bucket. It's just another, um, la- another layer of certification to make sure it's all legit. Mm. It's a pretty powerful statement, right? Being able to stand behind a product and talk about that with a contractor or a customer about mm. the qualities of what they're buying. Correct, and you need to back it up, obviously, with warranty. You know, you, mm. you, you've you've been in the uh, in the um, material supply market yourself. You know, I think you you sell tile adhesives and, and membranes, and most warranties are. Um, Defect warranties, you know, yeah. I, I, I warrant that my product's free from defects. You know, very, very few warranties are, I warrant that my uh, product will perform in that job, mm. which, I, which I think is a much more powerful um, warranty system. Absolutely. You know, I wish people would adopt it. Do you think we'll get there, that that'll ever happen in the industry in, oh, in, in some well, way, shape or form? Uh, until such time that it is a, a legal requirement to follow the Australian standards? Probably not. Mm. You know, I don't think a lot of people actually know that there's no legal requirement to follow the vast majority of Australian standards. There's some look um, safety standards of, you know, toys and vehicles and all that sort of stuff. They're, they're um, legally required standards. Building in bushfire zone, That's that's a... That standard is, is empowered by an act of by a section of an act of parliament, so you have to follow that. All Australian, all other Australian standards are virtually voluntary. Mm-hmm. You know, like ASN ZS four eight five A, which is the internal waterproofing membrane standard. You don't really have to sell. You don't really have to follow that standard if you're selling a waterproofing membrane into the market. Mm-hmm. But what you can't do is you can't say that it complies when it doesn't. Yes. That'll get you in trouble. Mm. Uh, same with tile adhesives. There's plenty of tile adhesives in the market where nowhere on the data sheet does it say that this tile adhesive complies with ASISO 13007. Mm. That's not illegal. 
what would be illegal is if they said it and it doesn't comply. Yeah. Right. However, the other side of that is as a contractor, you're likely to have a contractual obligation to follow the standard that is applicable to your trade. Mm. And 3958 says, you currently says is you should use tile adhesives that comply with the standard. The new one has slightly different wording. It'll, it will say you shall use adhesives that comply with that standard. So that ambiguity is taken away. And that's really important that that's mm. removed. And, and you touch on a really awesome point. I know that we've had a couple of brief conversations about that. And I've been aware of the fact that a committee has been working on a updates to the existing standard. You and the team have been working, I imagine, pretty tire tirelessly over the last couple of years or few years to get it to where it is today. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what's what's coming or what's here already? <laughs> well, can't give a lot of it away, unfortunately. If, if people want to uh, look at it, they need to make have a look at the public comment draft. And look, I'm happy for you to put a link in the comments of, of the bottom of this video. People should really... Absolutely. Look at it in comment. But it, it is so the current standard 3958.1 um, and point two uh, are basically both guides. Mm. So 3958.1 was published in 2007. It is an age standard and required um, review. Um, so that was done. 3958.2, I'm pretty sure, was published in 1992. Wow. And that was that's a super aged one, and that's selection of a ceramic tiling system. So you and I both know, and so does every one of your listeners, that the tiling systems have significantly changed in that time. Yeah. Uh, so they've they've now been combined into one document. So three nine five eight doesn't have point one or point two anymore. It's just three nine five eight, and it's installation of ceramic and stone tiles. So it now covers all tiles, whether they're stone. And stone includes reconstituted and natural stone, of course. Mm. And so it's no longer a guide. So I don't know whether you're aware of the difference between shell and should in an Australian standard. I would be not the best at um, saying that I am or am not. So, so in simple <laughs> terms, if a standard says you shall do this, Yep. It's a mandatory statement. So in order to follow this standard, which you might, you're might you likely to be um, contractually obliged to follow, if it says shall, then you must, you must do whatever it says, right? If it says should, it's kind of optional. Right. However, if you don't follow it, you want to have a bloody good reason not to. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So... In the in three nine five eight point one, which is still the current standard, it actually says the word shall only once, believe it or not. Mm. And that is it is for applying adhesive with a notch trail. And it talks about applying the adhesive and uh, drawing the notch trail through the adhesive in creating ribs. And the line says the ribs shall be horizontal for walls. Mm. That's the only time it says shall. Everything else is all short. So Literally, um, whatever is in the standard currently is technically optional. Um, yeah, right. However, however, your contract, yeah, y y it'll be a tough argument to say, oh, it says should, therefore I didn't have to follow. Yeah. So, but, you know, in the new standard, it's got hundreds of shells. Yeah, right. You shall use an adhesive that meets the, the adhesive standard. You shall do this. You shall do that. So it, it removes the ambiguity. It doesn't mean because, uh, like I said, there's no legal requirement to follow the standard. It doesn't mean that you have no option other, to, other than to do what's in the standard. Um, if you... Look, let, let's be honest. If the tiles are stuck to whatever you're sticking them to for the next 25 years, no one's going to ask you any questions. Correct. It's only when they fall off that 
people like me come in and go, all right, let's compare these to what it said in the standard. Yeah. And if you haven't, if it doesn't meet the standard, well, sorry, Mr. Toller, you have some work to do. Yeah. And that was the case with me. You know, I, the main reason why I ended up in the consulting space was I actually had a, uh, a failure of tiles installed to a pool surround. And I had to dig them all up and replace them. And the people told me, and this was in like probably 1999, I did that job, like very early in my, my, you know, working for myself career. Um, and people told me, well, you haven't followed the standards here, 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 and here. And I thought, might be a good idea if I read this bloody standard. Eh? So I read the standard and that sort of led me to a point where, right, so there's that standard. I wonder what other standards there are. And then, you know, it just went away from there. Look, when I when I bought the, the tile shop and you're supplying tiles and, you know, there's another 13 or 14 standards that have to do with tiles, mm. you know. Um, if you're supplying tile adhesives to contractors or consumers, you want to make sure the adhesives that you're selling actually, you know, do what they say they're going to do. So, you know, that really opened my eyes to what standards are out there, you know, and what you need to read. Mm. I remember from my time in the adhesive waterproofing space working for a couple of different um, manufacturers here in Australia, one of the big things that we would talk about a lot when we we're on um, job sites, and unfortunately back in the days when I was working and going to job sites, it was never a good phone call. Um, it was, you know, I need you to come and have a look at it. I've got an issue with the product, um, where today it's very different. Um, today there's a lot, I know a lot, a lot of the companies are very good at training and going to site and spending time with some contractors and, and many contractors out there. So the, the industry has changed a lot in the, in, in the past decade. However, it was, there was always that um, one of the things that I always tell people when I go out there is that, um, and I'd leave them with uh, the, informa uh, the information on where to actually purchase a copy of the standards. So they had that with them so that in future they could, reference that guide because it mm -hmm. there was always times where people would you know contact you and ask you questions and i'm like for that small investment just have it in your car your your, your van whatever have it there you know um because yeah you know, when i was in the industry digital wasn't as prolific prof, uh, proficient as what it is today and um so yeah it was one of the things that we used to do often yeah and look realistically Australian standards really have a, a life of 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. So when you buy a standard, it's going to be in force for 10 years, give or take, unless there's some major changes in the building code. And the tiling standard's probably going to cost you, the new one, it's a pretty big document. I'd say it's probably going to be 350 bucks. Yeah. That's 35 bucks a year. Come on. Cheap insurance. It's... Well, it's not so much even that it's insurance. It is at least you can say, okay, I'll follow the standard, but it's still gone wrong. What's happening? Yeah. You know, and there's provisions in the standard, especially in the new one, that as a contractor, you should be able, you should use um, to, in your negotiations with a builder. Like in the waterproofing standard, for example, it says the substrate must be prepared to such and such a standard. So as a waterproofer, why if if, you, if the builder gives you a substrate that isn't any good, you, there's no reason why you can't use the standard to say, hey, Mr. Builder, I'm contractually obligated to follow the standard. The substrate you've given me doesn't meet that standard. Mm. Can you please fix it up? Or um, here's my quote to fix it for you. Yeah. There's no, and, and I think contractors are, are really need to use the standards in their favour more, rather than seeing it as something. Oh, now I've got to do this because this idiot of the standards committee have written this up. Well, use it for your own benefit. Mm. At the end of the day, we're all looking for the same outcome, right? Mm. We want a job that looks good and doesn't fail. I really don't think anyone goes out, wakes up in the morning, and goes.
because I really going to stuff 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 things up today. Yeah, you know, I think everyone everyone's in the same boat. I don't think anybody intentionally plans to go back to a job site more than once. No, it's, you know. it's ludicrous if you did. Yeah, and look that it that that failure that I had didn't cost me a lot of money. You know, to be honest, but made it put a bit of a hole in my ego, and I said to myself, "These things are never happening again." Mm. And it didn't. Yeah, mm. pretty uh, pretty powerful lesson to learn from, hey. Well, you know, just uh, you learn a new lesson every day, really, don't you? Well, yeah. 1% mm. change every day, mate, by the end of the year, 37% increase in year on year. That's it. Mm. So I'm going to definitely put that um, link in the show notes. Um, not that we're finished yet, by the way. Um, and when does the, uh, when does the, when's the cutoff for public comment? Ah, uh, look, I oh. I think it's in early June, but I'd have to look it up. That's okay. It gives people a couple yeah. of months. Yeah. Or a month. month. It might be the end of May. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's you probably, if, if you get in there in the next four weeks, you can, you can have a, have a look at it. And look, honestly, if there's something in there, if people look at it that you think is silly or you don't like or you don't understand, please make a comment. Mm. You know, it's, that's the only way we can improve, we can improve these standards. Yeah, absolutely. And when, uh, what's the expected time frame post public comment shut off? Oh, look, that is going to depend on the number of comments. So what happens with the with the comments is they Standards Australia's project manager collates all the all the comments, and the committee um, reviews all those comments. And I imagine there'll be four or five meetings. Um. We review all the comments. We make whatever adjustments are necessary to the standard. Then it goes to a ballot. Um, if the majority agree that the standard should be published, then it'll be published. And look, I, I actually think it'll be designated 2023. So I wouldn't be surprised if it hit the shelves in September, October or something like that. But please don't hold me to it. I can't make any promises that it, it wouldn't surprise me if that's what the timeline was. Mate, that's um it's pretty exciting actually. I've been in the game a while and to see uh an updated um version of that document come out is pretty pretty exciting. Uh well yeah, you know, when it was written, so it was published in twenty twenty in two thousand and seven. Yeah. Which means it was probably drafted between two thousand and five and six. Yep. And based on what's in the standard, the biggest tile available at the time was a 450 by 450, right? So it certainly needed some updates just oh, based yeah. on the tile format to start with. Yeah. Uh, and there's been changes in other areas of construction. Yeah, there's more lightweight construction going in. So, you know, we've, we've certainly put some provisions in for substrate deflection that are a little bit stronger than they used to be. Yeah. Um. You know, stone tiles really were not covered that well, but now they're included. Who knew what a reconstituted stone tile was back then? Certainly not many people in Australia. Mm. I think the um, there's there's a heap of added benefits to having an updated document, and it's mm. also you you touched on it before. People can now have a more um, informed conversations. So the contractor can have more a more informed conversation with the builder and they can actually speak with a lot of um, modern substance around, you know, particular um, things that are happening on a job site and they can actually refer to the document. It's very difficult, although it was written in the early 2000s and then published in 2007, it's very difficult to pull that document out today and have that conversation because it's very, very easy for someone just to go, yeah, mate, it says 2007 on it, it's 2023. Yes. Um, oh, oh, mate, I'm I'm not really going to listen to something that's 16 year old. Yeah, well, that, that's that's true for this particular standard, but not for all of them. So there's oh, quite no, a few definitely. standards out there that are just that might have been published in the early 2000s, but have been reconfirmed because nothing's really changed um, and required them to be updated. Mm. So, but certainly, you're right that yeah, that particular doc document needed an update. Big time. Excellent. 
That's mm. exciting. Can't wait to see yes. it. Well, I mean, well, there's a bit, there's, there's a bit more a, to come. Yeah, well, I've got I've got my public commentary to do yet. So now that mm. I know the time frame, I will be scheduling that in to have a bit of a read through yes. and an avid um, avid reader of that sort of stuff. But what we also did as part of this particular process was we added two new standards into the pilot hoozy um, group of, of standards. Oh, nice. So, so we've now we've so you've got the thirteen thousand and seven series, which is always been for tyler hoozy, even for grout. Yep. As that was parts one, two, three, and four. We've now added part five and part six. And they're actually um, for waterproofing membrane compatibility with tiling systems. Oh my god, that's right. so good! Yes, so <laughs> very few people know that they actually exist. Right? Oh wow! Um, so they were based, you know, obviously, they're ISO standards, international yep. standards organisation, which we've adopted into Australia. Um, so thirteen thousand seven point five is uh, liquid applied waterproofing membranes. That are part of a tiling system, and point six is sheet applied waterproofing membranes that are part of a tiling system. Mm. And just the testing requirements are very similar to tile adhesive, except rather than bonding a tile to a normal standard concrete block to do the testing, you now need to stick them to the to the waterproofing membrane you're testing, and then obviously measure the adhesion strength after certain test parameters. Mm. One of the important tests, believe it or not, is that these tests actually test if the waterproofing membrane is waterproof. Yeah, okay. You wouldn't believe it, but the waterproofing standards we currently had, we had before, 4858 and 4654, there's no testing that the membrane's actually waterproof. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I know. Wow, right? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Onwards and upwards. The future is here. Well, you know, <laughs> if the future is progressing in a positive direction. That's one hundred percent. Yeah, and and uh, I authentically mean that. Like it, it's it's such a um, sigh of relief to see so many different people working behind the scenes to make this happen. And um, I'm not across all the different members. Is it the BD Forty Four Committee? Yeah, forty four is for tiles, thirty eight is for waterproofing. Waterproofing, yeah, I'm yeah, a member of both. Yeah, I, yeah, I know there's, I know there's, I know a couple of other members that are involved, but I don't know the full scope of members, and you know, I can only um, be thankful for everyone's time. Um, in um, yeah, it's it's the, the amount of time, you know, if, if you converted that into dollars, it's ridiculous. Yeah, you know, the, the the members of the committee members have given up, and it's. And there's there's the, the normal committee members, but there's also working groups which draw in other people with 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 certain areas of expertise. Mm. So there's there's a, a lot of time was was uh, spent on revising this new tiling standard. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm. I love it. Well, Frank, I'm going to wind back a little bit, if that's okay, and ask you a couple of questions because I have jumped forward somewhat in today's um, catch up. And mate, you've already said it, but I'm going to ask anyway. What's one of the biggest um, What's one of the biggest mistakes you've made in your career that's um, helped shape who you are today? Oh, that failure wasn't it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no. Look, I, I, look, I've I've made some blunders, right? Yeah. But I, I, look, honestly, I don't tend to focus on individual mistakes. Right? Every single thing I've done has led me to where I am right now, whether it was good or bad, it worked, it didn't work, and I'm quite happy where I am, right? Awesome. As far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, look, first of all, I think you need to make mistakes because otherwise there's no incentive to get better. Mm. It's kind of, it's kind of it's not unlike evolution, right? If you if you don't have any adversity, you know, nothing evolves. Not, everything stays the same. There's yeah. no need to change, right? So you need to make mistakes. Um, the only bad mistake is the one you don't learn from. Mm, agree. Um, yeah. Um, and importantly, and that's probably one thing I found. There's always a way forward. You might you might have thought you just made the biggest blunder in the world, unless it killed you. There's generally always a way forward, and that's what I believe. And the other thing, that's another important lesson I've learned is it's 
much cheaper to learn from other people's mistakes. So I'm, am I, am I, I'm going to guess that you're an avid reader. I, I do read a bit. Yep. Cool. Sadly, I read a lot of standards, so call me a nerd <laughs> if you like. But it's, it's kind of the – look, I, and, and look, I have to, right? Yeah. If you're, if you're in the consultants, consulting space um, and, and you're comparing things that have been done and failed to the standard, you've got no choice but to read it. And look, mate, I've read the tiling and waterproofing standards so many times. Mm. And I still find new things in there that I hadn't noticed before. And sometimes it's a different interpretation of something that I thought was written. But when you reinterpret and you go, oh, that could actually mean something else if I interpret it this way. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I, you know I, yeah, I do read other stuff as well. You got a particular flavor, mate? You, are you a podcast guy? Do you like, you know, um, educating yourself on different things or are you... Uh, whenever, I'm, whenever I'm driving, I, I have a podcast going of some description. Nice. Yeah. The world's way more connected now these days with podcasts. It's flooded um, mm. with um, so much content, but it's it's such an advantage, right? Because you mentioned earlier on in today's episode about you know leaving a legacy behind. I think that's a really super powerful thing to say. And to actually put into action because we have the ability now to do all of these types of recordings and interview people and, you know, tap into the knowledge that is available um, and share it with as the wider community and help educate mm. others. And it's awesome to see one for our industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm actually glad you, 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 you know, I was listening to the one you did with Chris Stenhouse the other day and, and he actually mentioned that, you know, waterproofing is moving forward in leaps and bounds compared to tiling and he's absolutely right. And I'm, mm. I'm so happy that you're doing this podcast for the, for tiling. Yeah, and hopefully people uh, will, I don't know how much they're going to take from, from my ramblings today, but hopefully they'll take something. You'd be surprised, mate. I I had a few people say to me, "Get Frank on, get Frank on. We want to hear from Frank." <laughs> so oh. there's at least three. Oh, three. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. No, mate. Look at I'll, you. I'll, I'll um, make sure that that the payment is uh, transferred. <laughs> uh, you're um, you've people like yourself who have been in the industry for a long time, uh, who the broader community want to hear from, um, as well as other you know different um, people as well, but. You've got so much to share. You've got. Well, no, sorry, you go. No, no, no. I was just going to say it's um, it's actually uh, it, it, it's excellent to be able to bring people like yourself and others into this sort of environment and just get the information out there to, especially to the younger people look thinking about or even in the trade to encourage them to stick at it and keep going because I know that there's a, a big um, drop off rate with um, apprentices across many trades. However, I think tiling gets the raw end of the stick because of, you know, some of the things that happen in our industry. Maybe, maybe it's not as licensed or regulated or, or whatever whatever words some people choose to use. They're not all necessarily accurate. Um, but, it, you know, we, we sort of, if we if we can encourage them to, to, to be more involved in the industry, they're going to stay longer. It's going to help promote, you know, tiling. Um, it's going to help um, the longevity of the industry, mm. right? And we're not going to hand it over to another flooring provider. You know, we don't want, you know, we don't want tiling to become this mythical f creature in 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 the lagoon somewhere where you know people choose to do it every now and again, rather than you know in every house. Mm. Well, tiling's just not seen as as a glamorous trade, you know. You know, I I worked for. Oh, probably 12 or so months for a um, uh, what like a group training company, All Trades Queensland. Oh, yeah, yep. So, you know, we employed apprentices and then we basically hired them out to, to host employers. And everyone wanted to be a chippy. Like you, you get kids in and they say, oh, okay, looking for apprenticeship, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to be a carpenter. Okay, well, you know, we've got way too many carpenters. How about, yeah, 
we've got openings in plastering, we've got openings in tiling, we've got openings in painting. And mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, sometimes you'd get guys, you know, not that I think group training is the best idea, but it certainly makes it a little bit easier for some employers, you know, to uh, to get apprentices on. Um, because you know it's a big commitment signing a, a kid up for um, for a four year tiling or three and a half year whatever it is now tiling apprenticeship. Mm. You, you, you kind of you're almost guaranteeing that person that you're going to give them work for uh, for for four years and 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 teach them that the skills to be a competent tiler by the end of it. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work. You know, business changes, mm. and the other thing is you know difficult to convince young people to come into a trade at the moment. You know, I don't know what you get as an apprentice now. It's probably three or four bucks an hour less than you get at McDonald's flipping burgers. Mm. So what's the incentive for the young people to, to start? Yeah. That's probably what we need to address. And then you've got the other side of the coin where we all know there's a skill shortage. And when you're a government, well, how do you measure that you're doing something about the skills shortage? Mm. Well, the only way to measure it is by counting the number of certificate threes or whatever you um, sign off on in a 12 month period. So is the incentive now to train people or is the incentive to hand out certificate threes? In, you know, and that's how we end up having a skills shortage. Um, in an actual skill level rather than skills. You know, we've probably got a skill level shortage than a, than a skill shortage. Mm. And that's yeah, probably what we need to address. And, and you know, just because you've got a cert three, that's another lesson I learned. doesn't mean you, you're good enough to run your own business, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, you've just become a competent tiler running your own business. That's a whole other equation. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's a, yes. it's a statement it's a statement that I heard recently. Of, um, I'm doing a bit of volunteer work now up here in Queensland, and I've, I'm going through a whole bunch of comp competency training at the moment. And one of our trainers said to us only a couple of weeks ago, he said, "Yes, just because you've received the certificate to say that you're competent doesn't mean uh, sorry to say that you're compliant, or maybe I'm saying this wrong, but doesn't mean that you're competent in being able to." Um, practice what you've learned or to implement what you've learned until you've practiced it, practiced it a number of times because the certificate says one thing, but if you actually don't apply what you've learned on a regular basis, there's, there's, there's probably not a lot of way that you can become proficient over mm. a short and long period of time. Yeah, well, if you have a look at the, the government training website, the, the certificate three level, right? if you, if you have a and a qualification at that level. It really, the intention is that that makes you competent to work in that qualification as part of a team. Uh, it is not meant to qualify you to be the owner of that business or to lead that team. Mm. Yeah. The system, you know, you know in Germany where, where I grew up, the system is, 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 I think, if they're still doing it right now, but it was certainly better at the time so you had to do your apprenticeship then you had to work for two years as a tradesman and then you had to go to what they call master school which was six months full-time master school and then you're a master of top wall and floor tiling and only then could you operate your own business yeah wow and that might be difficult to do these days with you know and it's got to be funded somehow but then you're certainly much more ready to run your own business. And, you know, sometimes I think we're actually setting young fellas or ladies up to fail mm. by give, giving them a Cert 3. To get a, a Queensland license as a contractor, you need to have a Cert 3 in whatever trade. Um, the Cert 3 counts as experience, the time you spent. And then you need to go and do a, a business management course. And the business management course is you show up on Friday, they wake you up on Sunday afternoon and here's your certificate, essentially. You know, there's mm -hmm. a little bit more to it, but yeah. it's not that. But you know, if you think you can you learn how to run a business in three days, oh, you know, I have news 
Yeah. Yeah, it's a pipe dream, right? Mm. <laughs> well, mate, um, tell me you've held various roles throughout your career. Is there a favourite position or role that you've held in uh, everything oh, you've done? I'm like this role right now is yeah. is is by far my favourite. I mean, look, the time at Basehead, establishing the system there, putting the training centre in place, fantastic. Look, yeah, and you know, but I've achieved I achieved what I wanted to achieve there, and, and really what I was originally hired for, and I've I've come back into consultant consulting. What I don't like in this business is go to jobs that have failed. That yeah. bit I hate because I've just basically got to say to someone, mate, you really stuffed this up and here are the reasons why. Right? What I'd rather do and which is what I try and spend more time on is actually get involved with builders and architects and contractors at the design stage. Mm. Right, let's, let's get together. Let's, let's have a look at the design and the selection of products and what you're doing and try and avoid the problems before they happen. And you do that more in a waterproofing space than in a tiling space. But, uh, you know, certainly, you know, I'm in, in, I've been involved in eight-storey tile facades of buildings. Now, you really got to think about what you're doing with that because if you've got a 600 by 300 porcelain tile coming down the wall from eight storeys high, I'll do a little bit of damage to someone if it hits them in the head. Mm. Yeah. And I've seen those collapse. There was a, you know, I've been involved in a rectification of one of those jobs. Mm. Apparently, yeah. spot fixing tiles on, on, on these walls was a good idea. Yeah. Still a very common practice that happens out there today, unfortunately. Well, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you must not do spot fixing. But if you do, you certainly must pick the right adhesive. There's certainly adhesives where the manufacturer says this is suitable for spot fixing. Yeah. But it's um, it's going to be epoxy based or you know two part polyurethane based. Mm. It's not going to be a a, a twenty five dollar bag of rubber based adhesive. No, no, definitely not. I think a lot of the times people underestimate the other parameters around jobs, and uh, and sometimes they think that. That method can work. It's universal. You just apply it, apply it to anything, and it, it should work. But mm. fortunately, we all know that that's not necessarily the case. And of course, the whole thing changes if your substrate is a waterproofing membrane. Mm -hmm. Because if you're spot fixing to a membrane, well, it's got a certain adhesion strength to its substrate, and if you're concentrating all those loads off the tiling system to four or five spots, yeah, you know, then is the membrane going to be strong enough to hold it in four or five spots? If you have 95% mm. adhesive coverage across the whole tile, you know, there's plenty of structural membranes out there that, that will do eight stories on a on a, a masonry substrate, no problem. Mm. Yeah. But if you're spot fixing to a membrane, you, there's a good chance you're going to rip the membrane off the wall before you're doing anything else. Yeah. I'm sure that you've seen plenty of those jobs. I do, but yeah, you know, like I said, the, the, my favourite bit is to prevent the problems, and mm -hmm. I, I would probably get oof, an average of five phone calls a week of contractors that I know, you know, that'll just ring up and say, "Hey, I got this job. Um, what do you think I should do?" And I'm more than happy to talk to, talk them through what I think. Um, I, I'd rather do that than be engaged later on by by a homeowner or, or a court of law to figure out why, go, why it went wrong. Mm. I don't know if you any money out of that, but, you know, it's still, it, that makes me much more happy uh, than dealing with the issues and, and uh, later on. Mm. And that's still going to occur. And it's, you know, especially in the waterproofing stage, it's not often the waterproofer's fault. Quite often, it was built wrong to start with mm. or poorly designed. And, and it's, I guess it's the same, same story for timing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Frank, you've been um, a champion today. I really, uh, really appreciated having you on the show. And um, we always like to finish off with a f some fast track questions. So I'm going to throw a couple at you today before we, uh, before we wrap things up. Here we go. So um, that's all right, mate. They're not too curly. 
Uh, tell me if you could choose, um, if you could choose a country in the world to live um, beyond uh, beyond home here in Australia, where would uh, where would you live? This might surprise you. Um, Egypt. Oh, how mm. so? Well, we we my wife and I went to Egypt in two thousand and five, six, something like that. And it's just fantastic. Uh, it was, you know, we, we both, when we were over there for, you know, quite a while, obviously looked at all the old, old stuff, did a Nile cruise, but it was, we said to each other, oh, you know, we could retire here. Uh, I'm qu quite happy to live there. Yeah, wow. Probably won't happen, but, you know, in Australia, if I had the money, I'd have a, a winter house in Port Douglas and a summer house in, somewhere on the, uh, in Tasmania. Oh my God. I think, that would be ideal. Yeah. You and I both, mate. I, I think if I could choose <laughs> two different places to live in Australia during winter and summer, <laughs> there would be two. <laughs> mm. We've um we talked a little bit about before about um reading and podcasts. Uh, is there anything at the moment in particular that you're listening to or reading that um is um you want to share with us what 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 is it what what you know is there something that's um really you're interested in that we'd like to know about? Oh look, I I listen to so many different things. I listen to you know Lex Friedman's podcast. I listen to Andrew Huberman's podcast, and you know it's it's kind of the the bits, you know, how people, what makes people think, what goes in, on in people's head, how does, you know, different chemistry of affects people's, um, and I'm, I'm not talking illicit substances yeah. chemistry <laughs> either, right? That's a Joe um, Rogan podcast, mate, I think, that one. Yes. Oh, well, quite a few of those. I, I, I've, I've listened to a few of his as well, but, yeah, you know, they're the sort of things I listen to. I, 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 I like to understand what makes people tick and in and and why people behave certain ways. Mm. And 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 probably the main reason for that is in, in the consultancy space, if something goes wrong, you, you, half the time you actually act as a mediator. Uh, because the, the worst outcome is a court date for anybody. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so if you can get to a point where you can say to the homeowner, Okay, how about we have a separate conversation with a contractor? We'll just have a chat outside and we'll come to a solution. Uh, are you happy if your outcome is that your bathroom, whatever it is, is fixed up and it's and you got a habitable home? Yes, I'll be happy. Right, that's established. Let's talk to the contractor and see how we can get to that point. So, and that's kind of the reason why I listen to that stuff. Um. And it's it's just way easier. If you yeah. have to go to court, it's just a nightmare for everybody. Yeah. No, they're um there's some there's some cool authors. Yeah, there is. Yeah. And you know, if you've got a problem, I know it affects you and I've been there myself in, in when I had that tiling failure, I really I was reasonably young. I didn't want to deal with it and, you know, put my head in the sand for a little while, but in the end of the day, when I resolved it, I fixed it. I, you know, I created it, sealed the movement joint, got out of there. Man, it was like a seven ton weight off my shoulders because mm -hmm. that episode was just done with. And, and I think people just need to, if you've got a problem, just deal with it, move on because otherwise, you know, that dark cloud hovering around your head for weeks and weeks and weeks is it's not healthy. Just, no. It's much better just to pick that up. And look, if, if I'm more than happy, if someone has an issue and they need my help, fine. Happy to talk you through it. Happy to uh, to um, you know come to site, talk to the homeowner, come to a solution. Let's do it. Mm. Yeah, it's um that's a pretty honourable thing to offer, Frank. And I know that that that's your character and the person that you are, and it's um it's a really beautiful thing to to say. Well, some people might disagree with you on that. Mm, we're all different we're all different mate you know it's okay we're all, we all have different opinions <laughs> one last uh 
fast track question, mate, and then we'll uh, I'll let you get out of here. Um, what is what do you think the uh, what do you think the construction industry is going to look like in the next five to ten years? Oh, well, I can't see a huge amount of changes because a lot of the work still needs hands on. Mm. Yeah, you know, you're working three D print houses. You know, you've, you've obviously seen those those mortar machines that are run around and three D print the walls. That's that's fine. Yeah, but I don't ever see a time where a tiler isn't going to be required unless we get rid of tiles altogether, which I don't see either. Um, Been around for thousands of years, mate. We can't get rid of it now. Yeah. um, The materials might change. Mm. You know, I, I, I think we need to find something other than cement as a binder. Cement is just environmental an environmental disaster, you know, you're burning a coral reef to make cement, mm. essentially. You know, the energy input in that is ridiculous. If we can find a, a more environmentally friendly binder to, to bind sand together and, and gravel to make concrete structures, I'm all for it, you know. Mm. They're available, but they're, at the moment they're bloody expensive, so yeah. they're not going to get used. Um, piles... Yeah, you know, people think that they're not all that environmentally friendly because there's a lot of energy input into baking them in an oven. But if they're done right, you know, massive longevity. So over time, the the energy footprint isn't isn't so big. I mean, there's you know tiles installed in ancient Rome, which is still quite in in place. So if it's done right, tiles last a long, long time. Thank you. I've seen countless examples of um, archaeologists digging up, you know, different ruins, and then all of a sudden, mm. bang! You know, you'll see this brand new tile bed that's just been um, hand brushed, and it looks like yep. it was laid yesterday. <laughs> so, mm. um, yeah. So yeah, I think there's always going to be something for the for the tile industry. Um, um, like I said, materials will change. Um, there's there's, there's going to have to be a big review of tile adhesive systems. Mm. We can't keep going the way we are with those. I mean, you know, back when I had my tile shop in the early 2000s, we used to sell a bag of glue for 25 bucks. Mm. Now, there's bags of glue that are still 25 bucks. Well, how do you get to that? Well, you have to take materials out to make the product cheaper and then affecting the longevity of the system hmm. uh, so you know I, I think there's some work that needs to be done in the tile of really space because we're going to get to a point of no return where you know you're looking at the life expectancy of a tiling system to be 10 years that's not sustainable we can't be doing that hmm. yeah. and that's better techniques in better adhesive systems yeah, you know, and look, it's easy for manufacturers are like everything else. Yeah, you know, they're in business to make a profit, mm. and they need to make a profit to carry out the R and D to improve the system. So that's you've got to have that cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, that's another you know, podcast talking about that. Yeah, no, 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 mate. It's um, it's a it's a great share. Trust me. Well, Frank, um, again, mate, thanks for today. I know we've been bouncing around, um with each other via email to uh, to coordinate today. And we've both had some other commitments outside of the show. So I really want to thank you for your time. And um, for the wider community and broader audience, if they want to connect in with you directly, what's the best platforms for them to reach out to you and have a chat? Uh, I'm not really a social media sort of guy. So um, probably LinkedIn, if, if you're going to go to one of those sort of product systems is the easiest. Um, you know, lots of people have my phone number. Happy for you, people just to ring me direct. And okay. I'm not really keen on putting my phone number on a uh, as a link because the bot will pick it up. But um, I'm sure if they send you a direct message, mate, I'm happy for you to share it or just contact me via LinkedIn. 
Yeah, you seem pretty active via LinkedIn, mate. I definitely think that that'll be a um a perfect a platform bit. to um mm. to jump in and, and have a chat. So we'll uh, we'll get that in the show notes, mate, for everyone to um have a chat with you directly. And and again, thank you for your time. Um, it's been great having you on today. Can't wait to uh, have a part two with you at some point in the future. Oh, I um, look forward to it. That'd be great. Once we uh, once we get into maybe the launch of the the new document and the new standards and. Uh, There'll be a lot to uh, talk about and hopefully we can generate a big buzz throughout the industry to really embrace um, everything that's been done from you and the team. And thank you as well for the work that you and the team have done. Um, I know Fred's, Fred's a part of that as well. And, and um, There's Fred and Rolf from Ardex and, you know, yeah. and lots of other people. Yeah. yeah so. And look, the, 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 the waterproofing committee has got a, a, a lots and lots of very knowledgeable people in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And well, there'll mate. be some changes there. And look, everyone, four days before the new building code kicks off. I know. She's coming. Yes. Have fun with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Frank, thanks, buddy. Have a um, have a terrific evening. And um, until next time, mate, stay connected. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it.